Greetings gamers, welcome back to the How to Make a Homebrew Campaign series. Last week I talked about the steps that you should take before you ever start planning your homebrew campaign. So if you haven't already, check that out right here. Before we ever start planning our adventures or the player's role initiative, we need to know about the world that our campaign takes place in. And that's what we're going to get started with here today. In last week's video, I talked about the narrow versus wide choice when you're making your campaign setting. I've already made a video on creating a starting town using the narrow approach, which you can see right up here. So for this series, we're going to be taking the wide approach. We're going to be designing the whole world and then getting smaller and smaller. For this series, I'm going to be designing the fantasy nation of Ashk. So let's head over to the computer and get started. And here we are ready to get started planning our homebrew campaign setting. The first thing that we want to do before we start writing anything down is think about the feel that you want from your campaign. Do you want something that makes people think of medieval Europe with knights and castles, lords and ladies? Or do you want something more similar to the Wild West or the American frontier where it's much more of a lawless land and everyone is out for themselves. A good way to determine this is to use a real world allegory. Choose a time and place in history that has a similar feel to what you want to achieve and then draw inspiration from that. So if you wanted to create a campaign that was based on the Roman Empire, you'd know that there'd be quite a lot of politics in it, a lot of political subterfuge and a lot of diplomacy going on in addition to the combat. Whereas if you chose to base your campaign on the Holy Crusades, there would be much more of a divine focus and much more combat than anything else. Using real places and events helps contextualize your campaign and it gives you and your players a really easy starting point for them to be able to understand how the world works. So if you, in your introduction to your players, say this campaign is taking place in somewhere similar to ancient Rome during the later days of ancient Rome, if they have any sort of familiarity with that setting, that time and place, immediately they will know what kind of things to expect. They'll know to expect lots of politics, lots of political backstabbing and underhand deals, etc, etc. So for our campaign, I am going to be drawing heavily on ancient Egypt, as well as some elements of the rest of North Africa, the Middle East, and then the Mediterranean coast. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be making fantasy Egypt. It means that I'm going to be taking some of the key elements of ancient Egypt, some of the very first things that come to people's minds, and using those as a starting point when making the campaign. So what I'm going to do is just start out by writing a list of the things that immediately come to my mind when I think about ancient Egypt. This doesn't have to be factually accurate. These things don't actually have to have been true about ancient Egypt, but they're just what comes to my mind and helps spark my imagination. So the very first thing, obviously, is that Egypt is a desert country, so it's going to be a desert land. Next, I think of isolated cities and uh, nomadic people when I think of Egypt. When I think of ancient Egypt, I think of less of a dependence on technology and more of a focus on tradition, so traditional methods of agriculture, traditional methods of waging war, so things like not using firearms, etc. I think of a country that is more focused on divinity and religion and has lots of superstition rather than on the modern aspects of the world. So much more God-fearing rather than having no faith. Another thing I think about when I think about ancient Egypt is death and an obsession with death. The ancient Egyptians, to my mind, were obsessed with death. You know, the pharaohs 
buried themselves in these massive pyramids with all their wealth so they could take it into the afterlife. A lot of their mythology is based around death and the afterlife. There's obviously things like mummies. So I have a strong thought about death and people's view on it when I think about ancient Egypt and translating that into our fantasy world that probably means that necromancy is openly practiced and isn't looked down on like it is in other parts of the world. If all the cities are quite isolated then there would need to be quite a large trade focus because the natural resources of the country might be slim. They might have a few key natural resources but not enough to survive solely on so have a big trade focus which probably means they'd have a large fleet to defend their trade and another thing that I think of when I think of ancient Egypt is slavery and the slave trade and I think that Ashk should have a large slave trade because construction and war are really costly in terms of human life so using slaves is more preferable than using your own citizens and wherever there is a slave trade, there is going to be people who are getting rich from it. So I'd like for that to, when, when I think about ancient Egypt, I think about the pharaohs and their, their vast wealth and their huge halls of gold. Whereas the average citizen probably barely had clothes on their back and would be struggling with the day to day. So rich and opulent leaders versus poor average citizens. So now that we've thought about some of the key aspects of the real world allegory that we want to use ancient Egypt, it's time to start thinking about how those different elements actually apply to Ashk, apply to our homebrew campaign setting. So we know that the majority of people are going to be living in isolated cities. And one thing that I think would be really interesting is if these cities were like super cities, like city states. And rather than having a centralized form of government, we have individual city states with their own laws, their own rules, their own customs, which gives us tension between the different city states. And then those people that don't live in the city states are going to be quite nomadic. They're unlikely to stay in one place too long unless they have a reliable body of fresh water because the biggest driving factor in this desert country is going to be finding fresh water to stay alive. So if people don't live in the city states, they're probably going to be nomads moving from place to place from body of fresh water to body of fresh water. But that also has the benefit of if there is no centralized government, then these nomadic people are largely lawless and free to live how they choose to live. There's no city government to tell them what to do. No one's collecting taxes from them. They're just out there in the wild desert living their own lives. So to be able to afford all of the goods and materials that they would need to survive as a nation, Ash is going to have to have some sort of exportable good, some, something to drive their economy. And I think it'd be really cool if we had that be precious metals and jewels, things that are utterly useless in terms of surviving the day to day, but that they can export to other nations and make certain elements of the population very, very rich through their trade. But without that trade, the country would come to a grinding halt. So if the economy is driven by precious metals and jewels, someone needs to mine those things. And I think that's where a good portion of our slave labor is going to come in, because why have your citizens, why pay someone to mine your wealth when you could have slaves do it? And then thinking more on slaves, I, don't, I think that slavery should be accepted by the common folk in Ash. Maybe not because they support it, but there should be this aspirational element to it where people don't want to oppose slavery because they think that, well, one day when we, when we make it, we're going to own slaves and we'll be the ones living in great big houses and slaves will be waiting on us. And if we speak out against slavery now and slavery is abolished, well, we might never get that chance. And 
that would keep the common folk supportive enough of slavery. They don't have to outright be out in the street saying, I think we should enslave more people. But it keeps them from banding together and lynching the slave owners and the wealthy elite. Because the wealthy elite will foster this aspirational quality that people have and say, well, if you think that we should abandon slavery, well, then you'll never get a slave. What happens then? Are you going to work in your own mines? Are you going to prepare your own food when you have that much money? Are you going to pay someone to do it? Why would you pay someone to do it when you could own someone that could do it? Thinking again on slavery, taking slaves from the general population wouldn't work because there'd obviously be a mass revolution on the slave owner's hands if they tried to take just general population as slaves. So it makes much more sense to enslave enemy armies. So maybe there is there's no execution of prisoners of war. They are turned into slaves. Because better to have your enemy make you money than just be dead. And similarly for prisons, there will be very few full prisons in the country of Ash. Because, again, that's a waste of money. Why would a noble person pay to put criminals behind bars when they could shackle them, send them down into the mine and increase their wealth. So, so far the image that I'm getting in my head of Ashk is a realm where the wealthy elite very much control everything and everything that happens in the country and all the processes that normal people go through are somehow in service of this wealthy elite. The justice system is built around making sure that the elite have enough slaves to continue building their wealth. When they go to war, they take prisoners and put them straight in the mines. And it's not a public service. The the common folk aren't going to benefit from these extra slaves. It's just going to be the mine owners and the slave owners who continue to increase their wealth while the common folk are struggling day to day to just live. But all the common folk, or a good majority of the common folk, have that aspiration that if they work hard, that one day they might make it, and one day they might be the slave owners, and they might live in the big houses and have all the riches. Something that I think would be really interesting, though, is to have a counterpoint to this, have a person, a faction, an organisation that offers a change to the status quo and offers a different way. And I think something really cool would be having someone from another country, maybe an emperor that has invaded Ashk and is slowly pushing their way through the country, liberating the slaves in the super cities, changing the status quo in these areas and improving the lives of the common folk. And that gives the leaders of the other super super cities something to rally together against and they can stoke the fear of the common folk and say there's this foreign invader that's going to come and change your lives and you'll be worse off and without us what will happen you'll be enslaved all these sorts of things to get the common folk on their side so we know a little bit about the geography of the country we know about the super cities we know how the country is run we've got an idea of where their wealth comes from and we have a central tension the the city states versus the empire so now we need to know how ashk conducts war and i think that it's almost certainly going to be using slave armies based on their use of slaves in mining and other elements of the economy. I can't see any reason why they wouldn't use slaves in their military. So the city-states have armies of slaves. We need to think about how the city-states would keep those armies, because an army full of slaves is a dangerous thing. They might fight for you, but they're just as likely to turn on their masters or flee during a battle. So maybe the city-states offer 
freedom citizenship and a large stipend of, of wealth to any slave that serves a minimum term. So once a slave has been part of a city-state's military for X number of years, X number of campaigns, whatever it might be, they'd be given their freedom. They'd be granted full citizenships, which would grant them all the rights that any other common folk have. And they'd also be given a large stipend of cash. Now, this money would be a drop in the ocean to the slave owners. It would be nothing compared to the money that the slaves had either saved or made them. But it would propel the slave into the middle class and it would give them a way of getting a a leg up and a head start on some other people in the economy and in the social structure. Now, of course, there has to be something for regular citizens to be able to achieve this because if slaves were frequently being made citizens and being given large sums of money that put them on a higher social class than you, you'd be annoyed. And there are enough common folk that if they were all angry about this, they could overthrow the powers that be. So the city-states would probably also offer a conscription or a sign-up to the military whereby common folk could serve a smaller number of years than slaves for a stipend. And that would be a really viable route for a lot of the common folk if they don't have any particular skills and if they don't have any family wealth. A lot of young commoners are probably going to look at the military as a way to get a head start, get a sum of money that they can use to build their life on. So there'll be no shortage of either slave soldiers or volunteers or conscripts to make up the city-states armies, which means all of the city-states are probably going to be quite martial. So we know where the people of Ashk live. We know some of their views on different things. We know how they make their money, where the economy is driven from. We know how the city-states conduct war. I think the next thing that we want to do is think about language and naming conventions. Similar to what we've done already, when I'm thinking of names for a culture, I usually start with a real-world language. It's much easier to translate words into a different language to use for your game than it is to come up with a completely new language on your own. And you also have the benefit that you can draw on real world place names in the country or the region that you're basing your game on. So with Ashk as an example, there's a whole wealth of real world places in Egypt and North Africa and the Middle East and on the Mediterranean coast that I could look at and pick names out for different things. They might be names that I choose for places, they might be the names of goods or services of people. It gives you a wealth of naming options without having to look very far but keeps it all consistent because it's based on one region of the world and it will be much more believable because of that. All you have to do is avoid some of the more well-known words. So given that Ashk has some inspiration from ancient Egypt, I'd avoid things like Cairo and I'd avoid calling anything the Nile and things like that. I would pick more, pick words that are more obscure to Westerners so that my players don't immediately go, oh, that is a small town in the east of Egypt. It makes it much easier to drop them in without your players knowing. So given that our country of Ashk is very loosely based on ancient Egypt, it makes sense 
for us to use Arabic as the base for the language and for the naming convention. Now this doesn't mean that I'm just going to head over to Google Translate and start translating words directly into Arabic, although sometimes I will do that because it will result in really cool sounding places. But it more means that I will be using Arabic words as a starting point. So I might head to Google Translate, translate a word and then change that word a little bit to give me something that I like. Because obviously I'm not playing in a fantasy Egypt setting. I don't need to have the exact words. I can chop and change whatever I want to suit my campaign and to fit the rule of school. I think we will start by naming the capital city of this new founded empire that's sweeping across Ashk. I think it's a good place to start with one of the biggest cities, one of the most important areas in the realm. So we will head over to Google Translate. We will set our output language to Arabic, our input language to English in our case. And we will start translating words. So we're trying to find the name for a capital city. So we'll start really high level and just type in capital. And that gives us Ras Amal. I'm not a huge fan of that. I think it might work as a place name for something else. Maybe the capital building in a city. Maybe the palace. The palace of Ras Amal or Al Mal could be pretty cool, but for a city, I'm not really feeling it. I want something that evokes that this is a grand city. This is the jewel of the new empire. The jewel would be a pretty good place to start. Jewel, Jawaharah. A good thing to do when you're translating into languages that you're not familiar with is just use this listen option. Jawahra. And just listen to it a few times to get the, the sound of the word. Because as it stands, looking at that written, I'm, I don't really like it, but when I listen to it, Jawahra. I like the, the end of it, that hera bit. And I think hera would be a good name for a capital C. So we will go the capital of the new empire is Hera. And that is what I would do for basically all of the locations. And we will be covering that in a future video when we look at the map of the country and it comes time to name some of the important super cities. I'll be going through with Google Translate Translate in certain keywords, key phrases, and getting ideas and names from that. From here, I'd follow this process and name maybe 10 to 12 locations which I could start building a map around, which is what we're going to be doing in next week's video. I find it much easier to build the world if I have a physical, a visual representation of it in a map. So we're going to stop it there. I think we've got a good starting point for this country. We know some of the really top level information and once we've got a map and know some of the geography we can start really driving in and thinking about how this realm works. Think about the gods and their specific cultures and start developing some information on some of these super cities. But this is a really good starting point for you using a real world allegory. Thinking about what comes to mind first about that real place and then applying some of those elements to your campaign setting and fleshing them out a little bit. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and found my process for creating a new culture useful. If there's any particular aspect of fantasy campaign setting that you'd like to see me cover then let me know down in the comments below. If you're new to this series and this channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button because we're going to be covering every aspect about how to make your homebrew campaign setting in the weeks to come. But until next time, happy gaming. Thanks for watching. If you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below for new content every single Friday. And if you want to keep watching, well, there's another couple of videos for you to watch just over there. Happy gaming.